I think I fixed the video quality, hopefully it should be less grainy now. But I also have a lot of notes, so let's get started with chapter 16, 17 and 18. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, I'm Kat, and this is the read-along for A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Maas. On to part 6 and chapter 16, 17, 18. Pharaoh has just gotten saved by Tamlin once again, this time from Naga, and she just had her bath and Alice is brushing her hair. I have to say, Pharaoh has gotten used to having a servant real quick. I mean, she must have been used to something like it from her childhood, so maybe that's why it went so quickly. Just, I compare to myself and I would be very uncomfortable with the idea of somebody running around my house and doing all the things for me. It's different if you go, say, to a hairdresser and it's a service you pay for and then you're done with it after, but this servant and guest relationship is like, mm, I don't know, I, I never quite like those in books. Anyway, Farah is talking to Alice and is asking whether there will be a war if more fairies keep crossing into the spring court. And she also wonders why the other High Lords do not keep their subjects in check. Are they really subjects though? Because if you call them a subject, then I presume that you can call them into court or you make them pay taxes or something. And I don't really see that for Naga or the Surreal or the Bog in particular. So I wonder whether some of those fairies are more like wild animals, I mean sentient wild animals that do not answer to anybody. And if they are subjects, then what does this court look like? How does this society work? Farah keeps working towards making her less likable with every chapter. She tells Alice that she would do anything for her family and wouldn't Alice do the same if she had a family and Alice is like, I do have a family? And then Farah just checks her up and on, it's like, oh, she's not wearing a ring. It's like, yeah, because her husband and children are the only way to have a family. Like, the arrogance on Farah sometimes, just, oh, if I was her servant, I would have hit her over the head with the brush at this point. I think Alice is using her fingers, but I would have lost my temper with her at this point, I think. Alice speaks a bit about her family and she has two nephews because her sister and her maid were killed some time back but the children don't reside at this court because fairy and high fae children are so rare that they are very precious and uh, they tend to keep them safe. But we also learn that high fae children are not adults until they are 75. Can you imagine? 60 odd years in school and then I presume like 10 years in kindergarten before it was like and I can get on board with kindergarten but 60 years of school. I quite like Alice it has to be said. She calls Farah an idiot for running out into the woods to capture a surreal. Also why did she take a dead chicken? She could have just offered this guy a new coat and he would have answered all of her questions anyway. But then, aside from being funny, this also has the implication that the surreal is actually a subject somewhere and a pauper that needs new clothes but has no way of getting them otherwise, besides offerings. Very weird. Farah heads downstairs, meets Lucian and Tamlin, and gives us this very important line about how she's not cowering in front of Tamlin. Even especially after the afternoon she just had and I'm just like well you did this afternoon to yourself so mm, but good for you not cowering in general I suppose and Lucian drops something like oh yeah I wish I could have been there to help and Farah understands this as a half-hearted apology I'm just like well maybe he really wanted to come by to watch you die and laugh at it it's it's a possibility during this conversation we also learn that fairies can indeed lie. So this wonderful line of like, oh, fairies are always telling you the truth, unless it's, you know, unless they're omitting something, is bollocks. And this only concerns Pharaoh for like 30 seconds. Why this doesn't have further implications or more of an effect on her, 
I don't know because it has far-reaching consequences, I would say. Lucian leaves those two to talk and Tamlin asks about the surreal and what Farah wanted to know of him. And during this conversation he flinches at some point and cuts himself with his own claws. And those wounds heal up straight away. So this is how his magic is supposed to work, I guess. I don't think we've seen him hurt before beyond the bog where he actually needed help. So I guess this is the standard for how his power is supposed to heal him. I don't know how Pharaoh would have known before this point, but here we are. The conversation moves on to an actually funny part. Tamlin has taken the list of complicated words that Pharaoh had written down at some point out of the bin and asks her what this is and with the words on it it reads like a poem about murdering and then making his body vanish to him <laughs> and that's actually kind of cute. If I didn't remember that she also put the word position on there, I mean, is that for how she lets the body vanish after? Because the other words on this list kind of make sense, but position doesn't quite fit with that poem, does it? Anyway, Tamlin also speaks about how much Farah has given up for her family. And Farah takes this as pity, which she doesn't want. And this girl is so exhausting. It's like, can you just keep your pride in check? Also misplaced pride in check for like one minute or for any conversation whatsoever. But no, no, we have to be prickly about it. Tamlin gives us a bit of history. Because 500 years ago, when he was too young to join in any fight, there were actually enough fairies that were friends with humans so that they joined them in the fight. And Pharaoh is like, that's not in the mural I saw in the library. It's like, yeah, well, if it's not on the piece of wall, then clearly it's not true. Like, god woman. Hey, Cleo. Pharaoh seems genuinely surprised that any fairies would have fought alongside human beings. And I think that's somewhat obvious, and Cleo agrees. Because how else would human beings have prevailed so long? And Tamlin actually mentioned this. It's like, yeah, did you think just like ash arrows made that happen for you or what? And I'm just like, yeah, well, obviously, no, it didn't. Because, you know, this makes a lot more sense than human beings just managing this fight with sheer numbers. Well, and ash would, obviously. Tamlin says he would have fought alongside those fairies to ensure the freedom of human beings. And Pharaoh's reply has just floored me. She's like, oh no, I would have been on whichever side kept my family safe. I was like, oh, so you would have been okay with slavery as long as your family is fine. It's like, wow. Just wow, Pharaoh. So despite the fact that we now know that fairies can indeed lie, Pharaoh just takes everything else that Tamlin says in this conversation at face value. Because he informs her that he glamoured her family's memories. So they don't remember where she's gone, really. They think she's with a rich aunt or something. And they don't remember him turning up. But he also gave them a warning. So at the first sign of something strange or something dangerous, they know to pack up and run and leave the area around the border. Farah is fairly outraged at this. It's like, how dare he mess with their memories. But apparently he was worried that her dad would otherwise come for her and get himself killed in the process. But now Farrah's like, no, my dad would have never come for me. It's like, oh, why did you run out so excitedly at the side of the puka with his illusion then? It's like, but, but whatever. Whatever. Her family is safe, knows to run. And Farrah is mad that he messed with their memories. But it's okay, she forgets about this really, really quick. Towards the end of this conversation, Farah finally asks for paint and brushes so she can follow one of her passions. And she also offers to work for it to make up for whatever this might cost. But that didn't seem to have bothered her for like all the clothes, all the food or the room she has gotten so far. So I'm not sure what changed there. But anyway, Tamlin invites her to visit the gallery with him like two days later because he's busy the next day and it also needs to be cleaned so it has to wait a day but apparently there's a proper gallery in the house as well that he didn't particularly care for until this very moment i mean it's only like it's an ocean and him living in this house right plus all the servants so I probably don't need all that space they have a gallery and they will go visit and there's a small spark between tamlin and pharaoh i'd say 
overall in this chapter like her emotions just flip flop from one thing to the next like from scared to angry to humiliated again because she can't keep her pride in check to interested in Tamlin to flirty to it it's, it's just wild it's a roller coaster ride and not a good one chapter 17 is a short one and it starts with Pharaoh waking to screams from a nightmare because Tamlin has brought in a mutilated fairy apparently he's from the summer court and when Pharaoh goes downstairs to see what's happening they have this blue skinned fairy now without wings on the table more or less bleeding out and he keeps whispering that she took his wings and Pharaoh assumes that the she that he's referring to is the same she that she has heard of in the conversation between Lucian and Tamlin before and I think it's a bit of jumping to conclusions in theory there should be 50% of the population that's female within the fairies or high fae at least and that means 50% of the population could be responsible for this. So assuming that it's the exact same person that Lucian and Tamlin were talking about before seems a bit out there to me. Given how the plot in this book works, that's probably it. But I think generally speaking, it's jumping to conclusions. Farah tries to help by holding this fairy down while Tamlin looks at the wounds. Turns out his magic is not strong enough to actually fix this anymore. So they only have conventional methods to see what they can do. Lucian is entirely useless. He stares, then pukes into a plant or on the floor, I don't remember, but he pukes and then runs off. So very helpful. And then the fairy dies. Farah offers some solace to the poor guy by holding his hand and just promising him that everything will be all right. And then Tamlin goes off to bury the poor fairy. Farah wants to help, but he insists that something he has to do by himself because Farah can't go outside the house at night because it's too dangerous in those grounds. But later, when they have a chat again, Farah actually apologizes and expresses regret over Andras, finally. And actually, that's her guard down a bit when she talks about why she held this fairy's hand and how she doesn't want to die alone. And that's already it for chapter 17. And it was time that Farah showed us some decency. I mean, outside of the like, oh, look, she is capable and dutiful. It's like, yeah, okay, those are nice traits, but, you know, they don't really make up for all of the other things in her that just annoy me, like the pridefulness, the snappiness, and being a bit dumb at times. But now we see that she actually has some compassion and is capable of learning. So that part is nice at least. In chapter 18, Farah sets out to talk to Temlin and she's kind of hopeful that paints and brushes might have arrived already. And then she randomly refers to him as Tam in her thoughts. I don't think she has done this before ever. I mean, Lucian calls him Tam, yes, but she has taken on the nickname now. But only this one time in this whole chapter, so I don't know whether it's a genuine mistake or whether it's the first hint of like she's getting a bit more familiar with him. But it's the first time this pops up, I think. Also about the painting. We already knew that she liked painting because we see this at the very beginning when she's still at home. But now, I think since this chapter, it's all like, oh, how would I paint this scene? Or even in the last one, it's like, how would I paint this fairy skin? How would I paint his hair? It's impossible to do this texture. And now she's also going around the world. It's like, oh, how, how would I paint this scene? And how would I paint that? And she hasn't done this in ever. It's literally like she remembered, oh yeah, I like painting and now I need to think about my surroundings in those terms all the time. But she hasn't done it for 16 chapters at least. So you would think that if she was such an artist, she would occasionally think like this about her surroundings, whether she has tools to paint available or not. Lucian, Tamlin and Farah ride out to a glen to have an impromptu picnic, I suppose. They did bring a blanket and they just hang out for a while. 
First, Farah gets fascinated by all of the colors in this glen because it's the most beautiful place she has ever seen. And then she gets distracted by Tamlin and stares at him for a while. So having a good time in general. I think Lucian is getting a bit drunk in the back because he's the one with the wine bottle, but whatever. And I still think while they're sitting there talking, joking and just generally enjoying themselves, it's like these guys have forgiven her for killing a friend really, really quickly. It's like all animosity has gone. I'm just like, how dear was this friend to you if you so happily accept this person in your midst? I mean, there's a difference between seeing why she did it and possibly forgiving her and treating her like a friend still. And I think they went for the friend option really, really quickly. Tamlin and Farah head off by themselves and he shows her to a pond of starlight. It sounds pretty magical. And he suggests they go swimming in it and starts to undress. And Farrah's like, oh my god, no, I couldn't. I was like, oh, okay. I guess you're missing out because the way she has been staring at Tamlin at this point is just like, you want to see this, so whatever. But then Tamlin shares Lucian's backstory because Farrah asks why he ran away the night before and wasn't helping with the dying fairy. And then Tamlin just shares his whole backstory, like how he wanted to marry somebody that his father didn't agree with and how he was the seventh son in the autumn court and because it's apparently a struggle or constant competition who gets to be the next high lord they were all at each other's throats all the time and Lucian was just like no I don't care I just want to go around and make friends I don't want this high lord seat anyway so fuck that uh, so Lucian actually had friends in several courts and she started dating this woman and wanted to marry her and his dad got really miffed and then two of his brothers or at least two of his brothers helped execute this woman in front of him and then Lucian gave up the title for the autumn court and any chance of becoming the high lord and left some of his brothers came after him to just take out the last of the competition even though he gave up his title and therefore shouldn't be competition so they shouldn't have to worry about him but some of them came after Lucian. He killed one. Tamlin killed another because by that point he had crossed the border into the spring court. And then Tamlin just took him on as an emissary because he already had so many friends across many courts. And Tamlin himself isn't that great at talking to people. Now the issue I have here, this is not Tamlin's story to share. Like this is very private to Lucian and even if it's widely known among the high fey, it's really not his place to pass this on to Farah, I think. The other thing about the story, so Lucian has six brothers. But before we were told that high fey children are very, very rare and very precious. Then I have to wonder what's happening at Autumn Court. Are they like the exception that they have seven kids? Because I feel like seven kids is a pretty high number. And before I assumed that Lucian was like a different rank of High Fey maybe, because he was scared of the Bogot, Hamlin is not. So do you get more powers than you receive the title of High Lord or something? Or is he just generally so much weaker than Hamlin? I don't know, I feel like I need more explanation on that part of the world building. So after hearing this backstory, Farah is like, oh well, she understands now all the things that Lucian has said and done to her. It's like, he wasn't all that horrible to you. I mean, he wasn't particularly nice, sure. And then once again, the Suriel and Naga incident was somewhat self-inflicted and still doesn't make any sense from Lucian's perspective to me, but more on that later. Yeah, so I'm not sure what kind of behavior Farah expected from Lucian here. You come in as the murderer of one of his friends, like, you know, did you expect him to be nice to you or to be happy to see you? Because, mm -hmm. Right after this, Farah decides that she does want to go swimming after all, and she just drops her clothes down to her underwear and gets distracted by Tamlin undressing to a degree as well, and then heads into the water. So we just went from a really, really horrid conversation about Lucian's backstory to undressing each other with their eyes really really quick and jeez like if there's anything that's a mood killer it's that backstory about Lucian. Farah talks a bit about her family while they're in the water which is by the way 
thicker than water, very warm and apparently a very nice swimming experience. And if you drink it, it makes you very, very happy for some reason. They don't actually drink it because, well, you're currently swimming in it. Why would you want to drink that? But uh, never mind that. So Farah talks about her family a bit. She talks about how her dad used to be like the mer prince of merchants or something, a title that was handed down from his grandfather to his father and then to him. But obviously they were just sitting on a lot of debt. And then he made some bad decisions and then all the debtors came after them. But then Pharaoh also lets us know that no, their money didn't run out immediately after they lost the house and all of the other stuff. No, they had money for three years after moving to the cottage. I'm just like, three years? For four people? You have enough money to get four people through that many years? Either the people collecting their debts were incredibly crap at it because if they really wanted their money there was clearly a lot more they could have taken from you. Or they were really good at hiding away the money and then just lived out in this cottage for three years and they actually just spent those three years doing whatever because Pharaoh only started hunting when their money ran out. But for starters, how much money did they have? Because, I mean, how many of us have enough funds to just live somewhere in a house for three years without earning a single penny? So clearly they weren't all that bad off, even after they lost everything. So after their little outing, they all ride back and Farah sides up to Lucian, trying to be out of earshot from Tamlin. I'm not sure how that will work because... Well, the plot needs him not to hear this, so I guess his hearing is currently bad enough for that to work out. But Farah talks to Lucian for a minute, and he more or less admits that he kind of wanted her dead, that's why he gave her the info about the surreal. But then he also says that he's sorry he hesitated when he heard her scream because he promised he would come help. And this guy's just giving me a headache. He must be about as smart as Farah or something, because if you really wanted her dead, then you should have not given her a knife, given her less info, just enough for her to get the surreal there and then get herself killed. Or you go the other way and you really wanted to help her, but it doesn't look like he did. So overall for those chapters, Farah is finally showing some promising traits with her compassion for the dying fairy and the way she later talks to Tamlin when you get to see them getting horny for each other or whatever. Lucian is just doing my head in at the moment because he clearly needs more experience playing politics or something or backstabbing people because I don't know, had I been in this place Pharaoh would be dead right now. It took 16 to 18 chapters, but the romance is finally starting, I suppose. Or at least they're getting hot for each other, you know. It's, it's something. I will say the alternation between longer chapters and really, really short chapters is done quite well throughout the book. But the pacing is still somehow very slow and I find myself a bit bored at times. It would probably help if the character behavior would make a bit more sense within itself. But here we are, this is what we get. We get confusing characters that just do whatever. Now that the romance has started though, I fear we will get to see not much the politics, which is what I actually want to see. I want to know what's happening between the courts. I want a more thorough explanation on how are all of these fairy subjects of anybody. Like, who gives the Naga orders? Like, who can tell the Surreal what to do? And even more importantly, who had to say over what the Burger does? It's, I want to know those things. And I'm not so sure that the book will deliver answers, but we'll see. We'll see. It's still less than half the book, so... I hope there will be some answers in there. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll be back next week with another video. 
like and subscribe if you want to help this channel out and do let me know whether you can make sense of Lucian's behavior and would Fera be dead if you were in his place or not. Thanks so much for stopping by. Bye! And Hamden also says that he would have fought alongside those fairies to ensure the freedom of the human beings. Cleo, can you not eat? No, no, don't, don't, no. Don't eat my hair tie. Why are you here, Cleo? You can hang on with John. It's a tissue. It's not very interesting.